Good evening. And welcome to the nonviolent, cosmic, World House Assembly. That's different from last year, where we included the names interfaith and interdenominational World House Assembly. But because of the world we are living in, and the crisis that we are experiencing, I made the decision to eliminate interdenominational and interfaith. The rationale behind that is that the world is very divided. And unfortunately, some of the reason has to do with religious isolationism. And I thought that a memorial chapel named in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. needed to reflect his theology and philosophy in order to be a legitimate tribute to him. And in his last book, the last chapter of that book, he pointed us in the direction that we should go. And he titled the chapter of that book, The World House. We have taken that pretty seriously in this country. And people, when asked, might say, I'm a global citizen. What they really mean is, I have planetary interest. I feel a connectedness beyond my country to people on other continents. But an interesting thing happened here in the chapel. For many years, decades, we had on the balcony 50 nation state flags that were put up for the inauguration of Walter E. Massey as president of the college for his inauguration. And we chose the flags that represented the countries that our faculty had studied in and that our students were from. And a few flags of those who have been honored here, like Prince Cezanne of Jordan. But on the day of the crown form of the Otis Moss Jr. and the Otis Moss III oratorical contest, the students were giving their orations. I was standing in the rear. And I didn't notice this student when he entered the crown nave. But I noticed him when he arrived at the end of that aisle and started across the front of the platform. And that young man was carrying a flag. I couldn't tell which flag, which country it represented, but I knew it was from the balcony because of the gold spear on the end. And I saw him waving the flag in the middle of the young man's oration from this podium, and I assumed he was going up the steps and out of the building with the flag. I assumed he was stealing the flag. I rushed through the lobby, went out the side to see whether he was gonna right or left, and I didn't see him. And I thought he had beat me out there and had gone around the building this way. I called the police and alerted them to go two directions in their cars cut him off. But when I came back in the building and came down the aisle, I saw a flag on a pole sticking out of the chair, hanging in the aisle. To make a long story short, the young man came toward me saying, I did it, I'm guilty, 
It's civil disobedience. They're killing the children. They're killing the children. I took him by the elbow into my office. And I called the counseling office, but they didn't answer, so I then called the police. And five officers came. And he had another outburst in the office about killing the children. And they took him away. And the students immediately started the rumor Dean Carter had him arrested. No, I didn't. And neither did the president, and neither did the faculty or the staff. And he came in later in the afternoon, and we had a long talk. The flag was back up in 30 minutes. But in 30 minutes, I got a call from the Council General of Israel. And in 15 minutes, I got a call from New Orleans. One of our students was down there, and he knew about the flag, and he wanted to know, is it true? And I said, it is, but it's going back up. He said, good. I'm telling you all of this because on the Sunday after that, when I stepped off the platform after the service, one of my chapel assistants said, Dean, look at the balcony. The flag was gone. I knew that it was stolen this time and that it would not go back up, but I also knew I should not replace it because the student was playing checkmate with the administration. And yes, I'm the administration also. And I wasn't going to waste money on just buying more and more flags. So I called the president and told him what happened and told him what I wanted to do, and he agreed. Take down all of the flags because they were sending the wrong message. The name of the chapel with international in it wasn't doing what we thought it was going to do. Its nations are simply national states whose sovereignty is propped up by militaries. And we are coming from a nonviolent place. And so I said to the president, I want to take down all the flags and put up 50 United Nations flags. And we already have seven flying around the tower honoring Howard Thurman out there, the obelisk. And we have one sitting on the stage, which traditionally sits back there. And I have brought it up here for this nonviolent, cosmic World House Assembly. Why the UN flag? Because I think it is a nonviolent, cosmic World House flag. It has the globe on it. You can see the continents. It has olive branches on both sides for peace. And of course, I think I'd be right if I said, you think the blue is for the sky. Think bigger. The blue is for the cosmos. It's for the universe. We are moving from being global citizens to being cosmic citizens, universal citizens. Why? Because if you don't become a cosmic citizen, you will never assume the responsibility for addressing global warming. Please hear that. I could illustrate that powerfully, but I think my handlers are saying your call to assembly is too long. No. <laughs> I see Henry Goodgame sitting on the front row <laughs> giving me the evil eye. <laughs> and so we welcome you to this house, the cosmic world house, because the world house is in the cosmos. And we hope you will go spread the word that this is the nonviolent, cosmic, world house, dream center. And now I want to call upon my dear friend, Dr. Michael Bernard Beckwith from Los Angeles. 
founder and CEO, and most of us would say pastor, of the Agape International Spiritual Center. And I think it's in Hollywood, isn't it? Beverly Hills. Come right up and give us the occasion. Peace and richest blessings to all of you. It's my joy, my honor to be here. For a moment, this is love up on, on Dr. Marva and Pastor Clarice for the wonderful, joyful, joyful. A dynamic reminder that joy is, of course, innate to us as spiritual beings. It's a, it's a dimension of our life as souls that are incarnating, spiritual beings who are incarnating here in this human incarnation as spiritual beings. We are emissaries of divine joy, and joy is always the evidence of God, almighty God, all beauty, and God, all love. We love up on Dr. Lawrence Carter for 36 years. He's been pulling people together in this way, allowing individuals to break free from their limited paradigm, their paradigm blindness, that they may see the horizon of a greater yet to be through inspiration and inspired action. And so we appreciate Dr. Carter because he's done it again. He's taken off the flags out of this particular memorial chapter, reminding us uh, if we're going to really create, embody, and live the world house as it is described by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., then we are transcending are identifying with the countries that we were born in and the nations that we so identify with, nations as he's already minded us that are propped up by military and live from an egocentricity that cries out, we are number one, rather than saying we are one with the one, which is the great power, the great presence, the great love, the great isness of the presence the power and the love of God Almighty. And so he's inviting us to allow ourselves to transcend those limited identities with the full realization that nationalism, pseudo-patriotism, and all kinds of isms are a hedge against our connection with the presence of God. They create a, a paradigm blindness that creates a sense of separation Rather than when one is embodying the world house as described by Dr. King, we're living from a field of unity and oneness, not palliative words, but religion, true religion that is, brings us to have insight and revelation into our oneness with this presence that we may anchor this dynamic field on earth as it is in the highest heaven, which of course is within our very soul. So he's beginning, of course, with the removing of the flags, which is, which is courageous and powerful and allows us to think. Now, of course, most people on the planet don't think. They mentate, meaning they just regurgitate the same thoughts they had day after day after day. Their ego creates opinions and points of view and perceptions that they will fight and die for. But a true religion breaks free from mentation that allows you to have an insight into reality that allows you to see that your brothers and the sisters are everywhere on the planet, as he reminded us as global and world citizens, cosmic ambassadors of the isness and the presence of God. A true religion brings you to that. But I think he's inviting us to go even a little deeper. Religion is good. True religion, that is, allows one to become available to insight. Insight is an event that takes place in one's awareness where they begin to know what they previously believe. Believing is only going to get you so far. Believing is only going to allow you to perhaps have an opinion about something, and then you will fight for that opinion. Uh, but a true religion has spiritual practices that are birth insights, an event that takes place in your awareness where you feel and you have an aha, a satori moment, where now you know what you've previously believed. True religion is good, but he's reminding us that there's something called religism. Religism is a love of the religion more than you love God. And there are so many people that love their religion more than they love God, and they will identify themselves with their religion but they will not allow the religion to take them to the transcendent awareness of which the religion is to take you. Your religion is not to make you uh, protect 
and hold the package that's taking you to the transcendent. It is a boat. It is a transportation to transformation. But so many people love the religion more than they love God. Dr. Carter is reminding us today not only to transcend nationalism, to not only transcend pseudo-patriotism, but to transcend religiousism. Oh, I said that interestingly. <laughs> so that when we do have the insight and the revelation based on our spiritual practice of prayer and meditation, kindness, generosity, forgiveness, coming to the realization that this presence as Jesus the Christ announced, is closer than our breathing, nearer than our hands and feet, as the Quran indicates, closer than our neck vein, as we begin to operate at that, at that level. And we begin to anchor this rarefied atmosphere embodied, embodied as a spiritual being having a human incarnation. We begin to walk with the de a dimension of freedom we begin to walk with the mention of, of generosity and, and, and creativity and, and compassion, which is a very high form of love. Compassion is the understanding of the lack of understanding. So when we look upon the world, as he said, is divided. We don't get caught up in, a, in fear and doubt and worry and separation. We, have, we grow in compassion and have an understanding about our brothers and sisters who are still caught up in the cycle of hate and racism, and, and bigotry, and homophobia, and wars, and rumors of wars, and, and justification. We begin to transcend that, and I dare say that the world house, or the second coming, is really that which is happening in a sangha, in a spiritual community that is big enough and bold enough and powerful enough to hold the cosmic energy of the Christed nature by whatever name you want to call it. It's going to come together and all flesh will see it together. We will live as then that dynamic awareness of our oneness with the presence. The second coming is when all of us see it together. It's not just a, a singular being living that. When we look at Yeshua ben Joseph, Jesus the Christ, he was the evolutionary, he was the next state of human evolution. The shining example of the possibility of each and every one of us. So the next stage is all of us together. Going beyond nationalism and patriotism and religiousism. But allowing our true religion to bring us to the space where, oh my God, we really are one. Oh my God, regardless of the color of skin, nationality, religious persuasion. Even those who don't have a religion that know about love and compassion and generosity and forgiveness, they too get to reveal this presence regardless of the name they want to call themselves. And we get to walk hand in hand and arm in arm and with an awareness, not just a belief system, because you'll die for a belief, but when you have an insight, you'll live for your insight, you see. And then we will turn our swords into plowshares because we'll come to an understanding that justice without love is called revenge, and revenge can't build a global society. It's an impossibility. Energetically, it can't happen. He's inviting us today in his creative and bold ways that he's done for over 36 years. Took down the flags. Courageous. Jumped out of the box. Courageous and made us look at ourselves. What are we identifying with? Are we identifying with the vehicle to transcendence? Or are we identifying with being that transcendent being, that cosmic global citizen that can only come when we practice true religion? And you know what? When that happens, you'll be a better follower of the teachings of Jesus. You'll be a better father of Judaism, better father, father and practitioner of Hinduism and Buddhism and Zoroastrianism and all of the great religions of the world. You will be a better whatever it is because you won't be in the box of that religion. That religion will have taken you into the realm of ever-expanding good. And you will live 
in the world house. Now, Dr. Carter's reminding us that if you can't see that possibility, then the mind won't see the opportunities. It's an impossibility. If you can't see possibility, you'll miss the opportunities to love and to forgive and to share and to be kind and to forgive. You'll only take care of your own, what you think are your own. But when you open up and catch it, as Dr. Carter is leading us to do today, you not only see the possibility, you'll be the vibrational energy of that possibility. And he will say, here I am. Take me. Here I am. I represent the presence. Regardless of where I was born, what language I spoke, what religious background I grew up in, we're all connected inextricably by a presence that is never in absence. It's omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, omniactive. It is our life. I think I've gone over my eight minutes, but I, I will say it is my joy, my honor to speak to the occasion that Dr. Lawrence Carter has laid out for us today. Peace and riches blessings.
glee clubbers have another engagement that they're rushing to. Portrait honors will be our climax of the evening. But next, if you're following the program, I'm going to invite to the podium the 31st president of Alpha Phi Alpha, Dr. Harry E. Johnson Sr., to introduce a very special video that's familiar to the Alpha family, but may not be that familiar to you to help set the stage for honoring Dr. Harry Johnson and the House of Alpha. God bless Aretha Franklin. <laughs> August 28th, that week we had a earthquake and then a lady named Irene paid us a visit. And it was indeed a dark day for me. But joy cometh in the morning. And what a glorious morning this is today. As I stand here and look across the transformed landscape, I see a wonderful example of what we can accomplish with this faith and with a stone of hope. We come together today to honor and celebrate the ideals of an humble man who understood that all humanity is linked together. And we come together to dedicate the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial, our memorial, the world's memorial. Many of you seated here throughout this day and throughout this country have contributed years of your time, talents, and money to help us build the memorial we dedicate today. It has been both humbling and uplifting for me to be a part of this magnificent undertaking. Our hope is that through this memorial, Dr. King's legacy will continue to touch those who walked with him, those inspired by him, and future generations who will get to know him. On behalf of the Martin Luther King Jr. National Memorial Project Foundation, I want to thank everyone for doing so much, so long to help us arrive at this triumphant day in history. Once more, I also thank you to my family and to the staff of the MLK Memorial, a small group of folks that have worked tirelessly to make Dr. King's dream a reality right here on our National Mall. And so it is indeed with great pleasure and honor that I have to introduce to you the President of the United States, President Barack Obama. Dean Carter, guests, friends, what an honor it is for me to be here. Thank you so much for this portrait that will be unveiled here at Morehouse College. An honor beyond thought that I had a little bit to say and do at building what we now know as the Martin Luther King Memorial, which sits on our National Mall. It has become the fifth most visited memorial on the Mall in Washington, D.C. Thank you to my family who supported me along the way. Uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Joe Samuel Ratliff, uh, who served on our board. And thank you to Mr. Will Juris, who serves currently on the Memorial Foundation board. The undertaking to build a national memorial was no small undertaking. In fact, Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity fought for years to 
come up and conceive the idea to build a memorial. And so many of us thought as we went to general conventions, Brother General President and past General Presidents, ain't nobody going to let y'all build no memorial to no Dr. King on no mountain. And there would be a box on the table. Give us $20, $30. And the original concept was that this memorial would cost every bit of $1 million. Well, after we got the land from Congress, after we got the winning design solution, they said, OK, Harry, now go raise $127 million and build a fitting memorial in honor of Dr. King. My friends, how proud I am to stand here at Morehouse. My son told me earlier, how are you getting a picture at Morehouse if you didn't go to Morehouse? No, I didn't, but my money came here to Mo House. <laughs> Dean Carter, thank you and the staff. And to the honor, other honorees, I can't thank you all enough. Mr. J.W. Marriott, uh, in honor of him tonight, uh, very quickly, he came to our rescue early on, did what we call a dream dinner at his home in Potomac, Maryland, and many of our supporters from uh, the CEO of General Motors, a Ford, Tommy Hilfiger, came, not necessarily for the dinner, but to see Mr. Marriott's large collection of Ferraris in his garage. And uh, Ms. Harrison, I can tell you, my wife went and sat in one of his cars, the Mercedes with the wings that go up like this. And I said, you can't sit in that man's car. And she said, you ever go buy one? I said, not on your life. She said, well, what happens in the garage stays in the garage. Thank you all so much for the support of Martin Luther King, our past general presence, our general president. Thank you all for being here, our other honorees. God bless you. God bless forever the Martin Luther King Memorial and all that it stands for here in America and in the world. Thank you so very much. All of us need support, and I'm now going to bring to the podium Mrs. Debbie. Marriott Harrison. Right, I think first, before I say anything, they're going to show a video that um, is about my father and our, and our corporation. I'm Bill Marriott. When you're away on business, the last thing you want to do is hunt for a good restaurant. Well, at Marriott Hotels, we know a little something about restaurants. We started in the restaurant business 53 years ago. I have to make sure we do things right. After all, it's my name over the door. My dad would be the last person to tell you he was someone special. But for me, the entire Marriott family and our business partners, hotel guests, frontline associates, and all those who know him, we understand he is one of a kind. There's so much to admire about Mr. Marriott, but if I had to pick one attribute, it's his generosity. Yeah, Nelson Mandela says a good head and a good heart is a formidable combination. That is the type of leader Bill Marriott's been for our business. His deep devotion to serving others and providing opportunities to whomever he can, wherever he can, is something that truly defines him. Surely this is a trait he learned and inherited from his parents, Bill Sr and his wife, Alice, who started a root beer stand almost 100 years ago because they saw a need. Cold drinks on hot Washington, D.C. days. That simple, honest care for others is the DNA of everything that has come after. I started out working in the hot shop restaurant in Salt Lake City in the kitchen, and I loved the pace. I loved the fact that Things got busy and you were scrambling and you were working and you were taking care of the customers and I thought that was the most fun in the world. And so that's what I wanted to continue to do. I went to my dad one day and I said, why don't you let me try to run this hotel? He said, well, you know anything about the hotel business. I said, I know, but neither does anybody else around here. From the very start, dad poured over every detail, seized chances and took risks. Success came, but more importantly to my dad, associates came. Dad, you have always loved the word more. That's his favorite word. I think that you have uh, climbed the pinnacle and have accomplished that goal by creating the largest hotel company in the world. His parents' motto of take care of our associates and they'll take care of the customers meant putting people first. 
providing jobs, careers, opportunities, and brighter futures for anyone wearing a Marriott name badge was and is the greatest reward. Beginning with the first Marriott property to what has become nearly 9,000 hotels in 139 countries and territories, that care for people extends far beyond the doors of every Marriott property. I go to the kitchen, I go to the laundry, I go to housekeeping. I go to as many different parts of the hotel as I can because that's really where you learn what's going on. So in 1996, with the announcement of a memorial to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the chance to help honor a man who had served others at a truly world-changing level struck the deepest chords of my father's heart. He saw how he could help, and he gladly, humbly stepped up to do so. The Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial stands as a testament to a nonviolent philosophy striving for freedom, justice, and equality. Being honored by Morehouse College for his part in helping create this monument is something I know my father and our family will cherish forever. Thank you. President Thomas, Dean Carter, fellow members of the 2024 class of the Martin Luther King Jr. Board of Preachers, Sponsors, and Collegium of Scholars, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for inviting me to come to accept this recognition on behalf of my wonderful father. Before I say a few words, I would like you to hear from him about how grateful he is for this wonderful honor that you're bestowing upon him tonight. Thank you, Morehouse College, for this wonderful recognition. I am deeply touched and humbled. It was a great honor for me to have worked on the development of the Martin Luther King Memorial here in Washington, D.C., where he was a man of great vision and left a legacy of peace and hope an opportunity for all that they might fulfill their personal dreams. Thank you for continuing the legacy of Dr. King. And again, thank you for honoring me in such a wonderful way. I'm so grateful. This recognition means a great deal to my father and to our family. He just celebrated his 92nd birthday two weeks ago, and he's not traveling as much as he used to, but he says he wishes he could be here. <clears throat> I'm thrilled to be representing my dad tonight and to see his wonderful oil portrait. If you haven't seen it yet, go see it. It's in the stairwell. <clears throat> Former Morehouse President Benjamin E. Mays once said, not everyone can be famous, but everyone can be great, because greatness is determined by service. Truer words have never been spoken, and they remind me of the core values my grandparents established when they started that root beer stand in 1927. In fact, serve our world is one of our corporate core values. As a lifelong member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, my dad strongly believes in serving others. He loves our church hymn that asks this question, have I done any good in the world today? Have I helped anyone in need? Have I cheered up the sad? Have I made someone feel glad? If not, I have failed indeed. Throughout <clears throat> more than 60 years of leadership at Marriott, including 40 years as the CEO and chairman of the board, my dad prioritized family while growing the community and deeping, deepening our commitment to communities. Marriott and Morehouse share a commitment to creating access to opportunity and my dad admired one Morehouse man, Dr. Martin Luther King. While my dad never had the chance to meet Dr. King, he and Coretta Scott King developed a great friendship. He helped Mrs. King raise funds for the King Center back in the 1980s, <clears throat> and then he began to fundraise to build Dr. King's memorial on the National Mall, as you've just seen. My parents were honored to co-host the first dream dinner at their home with Dr. Johnson. The connection between our families continues. Last August, my brother David, who is chairman of the board for Marriott that you saw in the video, was presented the Dreamer Award by Martin III. 
in commemoration of the 60th anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech, another extraordinary honor for our family. I'll close with one more family story. On the third national MLK holiday, Mrs. King invited my dad to give a tribute during a prayer service at the Ebenezer Baptist Church here in Atlanta. My dad, who admired Dr. King's strong faith, quoted the reverend saying, only when it is dark enough can you see the stars. In his tribute, my dad explained, and I quote, <clears throat> over the years, Dr. King became well acquainted with the darkness of night, but he also watched as one by one, the stars burst into brilliance, and first in the southern skies, then the northern. He left this nation a new vision of that heavenly expanse of stars, a heaven where all men and women can be treated with dignity and respect. Today, as I stand here to accept this recognition on my dad's behalf, Morehouse College continues to be a beacon of that heavenly vision inspiring men of Morehouse to be candles in the dark. And they will lead us all to a bright future. Thank you again for this incredible honor. We thought that it would be a good idea, following Debbie's remarks, and in the absence of the Morehouse Glee Club, and in light of the fact that her father was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ rankings called the 70. And so we're going to have you here, the Tabernacle Choir, who will be singing here in this chapel September the 9th with the Morehouse and Spelman Glee Clubs for free. And on the 10th, that's a Wednesday, the 9th is a Monday. All three singing organizations will sing at the State Farm Arena to the public for free, which seats 16,888. Mark your calendar, the Tabernacle Choir.
Good evening. I have the honor and privilege to read the <coughs> citation for Wanjira Matai, who is being honored with the Gandhi King Ikeda Community Builders Prize this evening. And accepting on her behalf is Wandia M. Budi. The citation reads, Wanjira Matai, having embodied in your work and witness the cosmopolitan virtue, ethical and transforming ideals of universal humanity, cosmic citizenship and friendship, and planetary incarnation of consistent courage for justice, your passionate and nonviolent yet powerfully persuasive leadership is thrusting the urgent issues of climate change, youth leadership, sustainable energy, women's empowerment, and landscape restoration onto the center stage of global issues demanding action. With your master's degree in public health, and vital experience working on disease control at the Carter Center here in Atlanta. You began as Director of International Affairs, then Executive Director, and now serve as a board member of the Greenbelt Movement, founded by your Nobel Laureate mother, Wagari Matai. Additionally, you are Managing Director for Africa and Global Partnerships at the World Resources Institute and Senior Advisor of the Partnerships for Women Entrepreneurs in renewables centered in East Africa that are both striving to fulfill the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals while you also serve on the advisory board of the Clean Cooking Alliance, the Earth Charter International Council, and fulfill board membership at the Center for International Forestry Research. Since 2016, you have been chairperson of the Wagari Matai Foundation, aimed at educating youth and placing them in positions of leadership as a board member of the World Agroforestry Center. You oversee the African Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative to restore more than 100 million hectares of deforested land in Africa by 2030. In 2018, 2019, and 2021, you were named among the 100 most influential African women, and in 2023, were among Time Magazine's 100 most influential people list, which stated, for over a decade, Wanjira has worked her magic in rural communities and international halls of power alike. Throughout she has focused on restoration of land, love for people, and communities as she fights for justice and the future of Africa. Her weapons are sharp analysis, a love of people, irresistible persuasion, and a huge smile that makes it impossible to say no. You stand as a preeminent global model of right thought right action, prophetic personalism, co-creating Dr. King's beloved, nonviolent, cosmic world house, aimed at genuine and lasting peace in the supremely humane tradition of Mohandas Karamchand Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and Daiseku Ikeda. We present this award. Affirmed and witnessed under the seals of the college and the chapel this 11th day of April, 2024, Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel, Morehouse College, Atlanta, Georgia, signed David Anthony Thomas, PhD, Lawrence Edward Carter, Senior PhD.
We present this prismatic flame because Gandhari Mathai has been a light to the world. This is quite heavy. I'll let you feel it. proper engravings, and I won't read them to you. <laughs> we present this medallion with the likenesses, the profiles of Gandhi, King and Daisaku Ikeda. And under it is the word peace in Hindi, English, and Japanese. The name of the prize is on the top there, and on the back are their actual signatures in bronze and the conferring institution. You can wear this on all of the high holy days to impress your friends. <laughs> now this prize does not carry a purse but a library, because all three of the persons for whom the prize is named were very prolific in writing. One little antidote. I got a phone call from Claiborne Carson late one night, and he said, I think you need to be aware that when the 14 volumes of the collected papers of Martin Luther King Jr. are finished, those 14 volumes will only represent 2% of his work. Gandhi's work filled 100 volumes, each over 500 pages. And Daisaku Ikeda, made the Soka Gakkai International in 192 countries where over 20 languages are spoken. And he only spoke Japanese. But with the power of his pen and his travel, he published over 200 books. I hope this won't be a sedative to you. Here we have to do the citation, the Reverend Doctor Professor Ebony Marshall Terman of Yale University. I have been charged with the task and the great honor of writing the citation that will accompany the Gandhi King Mandela Peace Prize to be given on this night to my Dr. Vader, uh, Dr. Gary John Dorian. It reads thusly, be it known to all who look upon this script, Gary John Dorian, Episcopal priest, distinguished professor, and democratic socialist activist, is being honored having embodied the virtues of bold truth-telling, 
courageous justice-making, and profound care for a generation of theological ethicists and systematic and constructive theologians in your distinguished ministry of teaching for nearly two decades. As the Reinhold Niebuhr Professor of Social Ethics at the Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York and Professor of Religion at Columbia University and formerly as the Parfait Distinguished Professor at Kalamazoo College. Your teaching and leadership in the field of Christian social ethics has opened new horizons for the Guild to think critically about the future of progressive religion. From the new abolition to breaking white supremacy to a darkly radiant vision, your magisterial trilogy on Martin Luther King Jr. and the black social gospel has boldly confronted the whitewashed lies that have rendered black people and their churches invisible from the meta narratives of US theological liberalism. Lies that have dominated the 20th century theological academy and conditioned emerging religious scholars and leaders to consider black faith as a mere appendage to a primary Christian story. With the stroke of your pen and your urgent commitment to careful scholarship, rigorous argument, and dismantling anti-black anti-intellectualism, you have done what very few white men in the Theological Academy have dared to do. Namely, you have countered and disrupted white racist theology and ethical inquiry by centering the truths of black life, black Christian witness, and political imagination while underscoring its impact on the church and the world. Holding the degree of Bachelor of Arts from Alma College, the Master of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary, the Master of Arts and Master of Theology from Princeton Theological Seminary, and the Doctor of Philosophy from Union Graduate School, as well as four honorary doctorates, you have been identified by colleagues in your field as the greatest social ethicist of the 21st century, our most compelling political theologian, and the most rigorous theologian of our time. Having authored 23 books and more than 300 articles, your scholarship has traversed the fields of social ethics, philosophy, theology, political economics, social and political theory, religious history, cultural criticism, and intellectual history. The particularity of your scholarly emphasis on the 20th century black prophetic tradition as it emerges as a strong arm of US theological liberalism and as it has been promulgated by William Edward Burkhart Du Bois and Martin Luther King Jr. towering giants of black faith, social witness and culture is exhaustive, definitive and without parallel. In 2023, you won the American Library Association's Choice Award for your masterpiece titled American Democratic Socialism, History, Politics, Religion, and Theory. In 2018, you won the Choice Award for your groundbreaking intellectual history on the martyred symbol of the movement for black freedom titled Breaking White Supremacy, Martin Luther King Jr and the Black Social Gospel. In 2017, you won the Gravemeyer Award for your commanding treatment of the intellectual underpinnings of the civil rights movement titled The New Abolition, W.E.B. Du Bois and the Black Social Gospel. In 2012, you were awarded the Association of American Publishers Prose Award for your captivating study of Kantian idealism as the foundation of modern theology titled Kantian reason and Hegelian spirit, the idealistic logic of modern theology. And in 2010, you won your very first choice award for your monumental and definitive history of Christian social ethics in the United States titled Social Ethics in the Making. An Episcopal priest and member of the Democratic Socialists of America's Religion and Socialism Commission, your encyclopedic knowledge theological wit, intellectual sophistication, commitment to nonviolent anti-colonialism, democratic social activism, profound concern for civil and human rights, 
and social justice for black and poor people in church, academy, and the world situate you, Professor Dorian, as a preeminent global model of right thought, right action, response ability, and prophetic intellectual exchange toward the end of peacefully co-creating the beloved community in the supremely humane tradition of Mohandas Karamchand Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and Nelson Rohilala Mandela. Dr. Gary Dorian, you stand as a preeminent global model of right thought, right action, and prophetic personalism, co-creating Dr. King's beloved nonviolent cosmic world house aimed at genuine and lasting peace in the supremely humane tradition of Mohandas Karamchand Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and Nelson Mandela. We are privileged to honor you this evening. The symbol of our Peace Prize resembles the Howard Thurman obelisk in front of the building. It stands for a beam of light, the Mohouse motto, Expecta et Lux, and there is light. Your North Star in all of your publishing clearly points to peace. And we thought of no one else to honor this year than you because your work is absolutely unprecedented. To all of you listening, I announced earlier, Dr. Dorian is the world's leading authority on the black social gospel, a subject that African Americans know little about, but that is the philosophical set of theories that undergirded the nonviolent civil rights movement and guided King for the 12 and a half years. He was only the leader for 12 and a half years of that movement. We very proudly present this to you with all the appropriate engravings on all four sides. <laughs> medallion will have on it the profiles of all three persons. But I'm going to let the audience in on a sort of secret. <laughs> His medallion is not here. It's being made in China. We didn't get it because of the supply chain holdup. But I, we would have been told by the people who are designing it that you will receive it in the very near future. <laughs> 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 and it will look like this, as I earlier described.
Miss Molly Wilson, is she here? Okay, come right on. She's our soloist for one of our themes, No More Silence. She's going to do the theme song of the documentary film, Spill the Honey. Spill the Honey documents the oldest, most successful ethnic coalition in the United States. And that is the coalition between African Americans and Jews. Ms. Wilson. Hello, everyone. First, I'd like to thank Spill the Honey and Brenda Lawrence and Sherry Rogers for asking me and my team as a Grammy-nominated producer to score the Spill the Honey film. I'd also like to thank my husband, who is a Morehouse alum, who is a candle in the dark and has been for me in support of me having a movement for music that makes a difference. And so this song I wrote because I was commissioned by Spill the Honey. I flew home to Chicago with Craig Snyder, who I'd worked with as a decorated musician, and I made the mistake of opening up social media. And that morning, as I go in to write this song, I see that a young black 12 or 13-year-old, I think he was, was shot off of a porch in Kansas City, Missouri, by a racist man. He went to the wrong house. Those houses look the same, right? And so as after feeling the angst um, of what a mother would feel to have to get that call, this song, literally after Eric and I prayed, um, it just came right out. Almost lyric, melody, and all, which had never happened before. Um, Sherry Rogers was just so generous with her knowledge on Fannie Lou Hamer. If some of you don't know, some of the younger folks look her up. So I, I got to add some of the, um, some of the history. Me, my mother's Eastern European, my dad is African American, I grew up in Chicago, and Dr. Martin Luther King was someone that we looked up to. I mean, we had hoped to have that dream, so it's very special for me to share this song with you in this wonderful space with all these wonderful people. I'm very humbled and honored, and I hope that you like it as much as we did. up in a daze, hard to know, what is it now today, behind the door, the other side, we all got a rise, sometimes you got to do us right no more silent days no together there's a way Nobody's free 
until we, we all align. Oh, make that change. We got to stand up today. We got a choice today. Speak up and make a way. Now calling on Congressman Brenda Lawrence from Detroit. And she's going to introduce the next video for you. I want to say hello to everyone. I'm Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence, who had the pleasure of serving in Congress with one of your local heroes, the amazing John Lewis. We were in Congress together when there were so many demonstrations of violence and hate in our churches, in our synagogues, on the streets. And I went to him and I said, John, do we have a black Jewish caucus? He said, Brenda, you know I've worked together and on that issue my entire life. He said, no, I don't think there is. And he, I said, well, good, I'll join you. Let's start one. He said, no, you start it. You do the work. And that was typical of the congressman. He sent me to work. And I am so proud to be standing here today that a caucus is still standing today in Congress, the, the Congressional Black Jewish Relations Council. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the greatest tasks every generation is given, and it's the responsibility to record history. Every generation must document, record, and make sure that generations to come learn from our mistakes. And I am so proud to stand here today to introduce a video, a small part of a film called Shared Legacies where it took the history, real history, that some people don't want to be heard or seen, where the suffering and the pain of being hated and the violence that goes when hatred is unanswered, the black and the Jewish community, and the 
amazing history of during the civil rights movement when the Jewish community came and walked literally arm in arm with the black community. The black community who opened the doors for Jewish immigrants who came to this country and was not allowed to teach at major universities, but the HBCUs opened the door. There's so many stories of how blood and even lives of the Jewish community was given during the Civil Rights Movement. I am so proud to be able to introduce this video where you'll see the current movement of our chairman, Dr. Jones, who's working with Roger Kraft to start messaging on what hate looks like today. And I will say to everyone here, and you heard it in the song, and Dr. King reminded us, the rabbi reminded us at the March on Washington, the greatest threat to freedom is silence. And we have learned and we're seeing now, and I hope we never become numb to what we're witnessing. In this generation, not only do we have the right and the responsibility to record, but to speak up. And so please enjoy this video, thank you. Sometimes I imagine what I'd write today for my dear friend Martin. I'd remind people that all hate thrives on one thing. Silence. The people who will change the nation are those who speak out, who refuse to be bystanders, who raise their voices against injustice. When we stand up to silence, we stand up to all hate. There's an African proverb that says if the uh, lions don't tell their stories, the hunters will get all the credit. I'm telling you the story now because you're a young lion and lionesses. My great-grandfather had been in slavery and it goes across generations. You just don't get rid of it simply because there are no chains on you. We, we paid a certain due, dues because we were slaves. It's what they call a left-handed compliments on us and on the Jew. Well, there's a shared history that's deeper than we're talking about here. It's the shared history of the Egyptian and the Jew. It's talking about Moses. It's talking about the, the pyramid. We're talking about the old civilization. Slavery is not new. The effects of slavery are still very prominent, just as the effects of the Holocaust are still very prominent amongst our brothers and sisters in the Jewish community. The Jewish people have the DNA in their soul to look up close to what happened to African Americans after slavery. But it was those Jewish American friends that recognized what was going on and joined with us to create the NAACP in 1909. If you look at the list of our founding members, you'll see as many Jewish Americans on that list as there were African Americans. Most of the Jewish leaders that I met in the labor movement, which was very pivotal and very key to me, were very deeply involved with the welfare of black people because most of them were concerned about the conditions of the human family. We came to the South, young Jews, rabbis, many of them refugees from Nazi Germany. We hear Dr. King quoting the prophets. That was extraordinary. It made us proud. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said, the future of America will depend on how it responds to Dr. King. As a matter of fact, if you were Jewish or not involved in our cause, we held you in great suspicion. Jewish and black lawyers working together helped transform the legal landscape. Well, Stan Levinson and Harry Wachtell were lawyers who were working with Dr. King. They were lawyers, advisors, marchers, fundraisers. They were in the thick of things. Our relationship is rooted in blood, and that blood is non-negotiable. Many Jewish students worked all across the South. And I will never, ever forget three young men, Anne Goodman, Micah Scherner, and James Shaney. They were so viciously 
angry at Michael Swerner and Andrew Goodman. You know why? Because they were white and Jewish. And how dare they come to Mississippi and work for black people. The letter is the most important manifesto for social justice in the 20th century. In the text of that letter, in explaining why he has a commitment to obey laws which are just and disobey laws that are unjust. And he uses as an example, if he had been in Hitler, Germany, and he had been told he couldn't write or associate with a Jew, that was an unjust law. He said, I would have broken that law, an unjust law, and I would have associated with my colleagues who were Jewish. Cy Dresner never lets me forget that he went to jail twice before I did and that he was with the first group of rabbis uh, that came down to St. Augustine. When they arrived, all of them were put in one small group of uh, cells. Uh, they had come to support us. I said to them, welcome, we're glad to see you. Uh, I said, when white folk and black folk started going to jail together, then we're really making progress. We could not have gotten anywhere had not Protestants, Catholics, and Jews showed up from all over the world. Rabbi Yakim Prince spoke immediately before Dr. King. The most shameful and the most tragic problem is silence. The silence of the good people. Whew. It was powerful. There was a black Jewish coalition that nobody talked about. Rabbi Rothschild and Janice have always been like part of my family. Not everybody in the Temple family was happy with Rabbi Rothschild's sermons. Almost every time I would walk out after one of his sermons, oh, he's talking about civil rights again. It was just his constant, he never let up on civil rights and doing the right thing and he spoke with the voice of the prophet. Benjamin Mays was president of Morehouse College and was Martin King's president. And he made the decision that Morehouse College would be the first to honor Dr. King in Atlanta. And he could not do that by himself. Dr. Mays was intimately acquainted with Rabbi Rothschild. And so after Benjamin Mays made his first approach to Ralph McGill, his second was to Rabbi Rothschild, and both signed on full-throatedly that Martin King should be honored, not just in the black community in Atlanta, but in downtown Atlanta. There should be a gathering like there had never been before that was interracial. He has been acclaimed for his leadership his willingness to risk his life, his courage in despairing moments, and his persistence in the pursuit of peace. I take great pride in honoring this citizen of Atlanta who is willing to turn the other cheek in his quest for full citizenship for all Americans. Thank you. The great thing about this story is that it's a story of struggle, it's a story of overcoming, it's a story of identity and belonging, and it's a story that's ultimately about the universal human experience. We don't have to look for a new way of doing it. We have a template in our history. And now to take the coalition that we developed and to expand it, with the coalition of the younger generation, we have to come together and say to the country, we're not gonna take the continued persistence of racism, and we're gonna do it nonviolently. The soul of America is at stake. The answer is blowing in the wind. Like, I, I think the story that Spill the Honey tells is a testament to what is possible. It's a testament to hope. It's a testament to human connection and to friendship and to the political power of love.
say this pain won't last forever, but when will it end? I see my brother lose his life when he was only 10. Everybody got some blood on their hands. We gotta fight this thing together, that's a part of the plan. They can't break us to the ground if united we stand. Dr. King gave us this message from a cell burning hand. A threat to justice anywhere is danger to us all. If we take one player off the court, then none of us can ball. We're connected at the soul, so we can't let each other fall. If it's us against the world, then I'm ready to take it all. Thank you. That's only eight, eight minutes of a one hour and 30 minute documentary. And I want to recognize Dr. Sherry Rogers, who spent 10 years of her life getting voices in the history of the black Jewish relations. Dr. Rogers. I'm going to have a solo, Peace on Earth, by Chandra Lee Agraba. Agraba. <laughs> i 
We cannot heal our own. And where does this pain so on earth begin? If not in the home. Thank you. I now invite all of the portrait honorees to rise and your names are called. Harry E. Johnson, Sr. So invite all of the members of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity to rise. <laughs> we have here five, and with um, Mr. Johnson, six of the former general presidents of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. Nothing is inevitable until it happens. Courage is the greatest of all ethical norms. Courage makes the practice of all virtue and all assignments achievable. Harry E. Johnson, Sr., the 31st General President of the House of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, enjoyed the unanimous confidence of his distinguished brotherhood. Hence, the charge fell upon him to diversify the honorees on the United States National Mall with a non-elected civilian of African American heritage, universally recognized for his nonviolent leadership and his constant call for peace internationally. The $127 million MLK Jr. statue and memorial park on the District of Columbia's National Mall is now monumental reality. On behalf of our ancestors and a grateful nation, and with the sanction of President David Anthony Thomas and Chairman Willie E. Woods, the names Harry E. Johnson, Sr., and the membership of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity shall forever echo in the halls of immortality. My dear sir, it is for the aforementioned achievement as the founding dean, it is my pleasure to induct your oil portrait, your painting, into the Morehouse College International Hall of Honor. Alpha men may be seated.
John Willard Bill Marriott, Jr. And I have been informed what the world does not know. It isn't pronounced Marriott. Marriott is how it is pronounced. <laughs> Every Moses needs a Joshua. Who better to honor MLK Jr.'s beloved World House dream than the great lodging innovator of World House hospitality in 8,000 properties across 30 brands in 139 countries and territories for the challenge of raising $127 million to integrate the National Mall racially, politically, ethically, and philosophically. Bill Marriott Marriott <laughs> Jr. can do nothing I didn't write this. <laughs> I wrote something else. And it looks like what I put down here has been edited out. <laughs> well, Mr. Marriott became the spirit beneath the wings of Harry Johnson and the men of Alpha Phi Alpha who were the tip of the spear. With his parents' core value of putting people first, Mr. Marriott helped the Alphas elevate MLK Jr. as a modern day founding father of a more perfect union, joining the status of George Washington Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and Franklin D. Roosevelt, and by doing so, adding the greatest voice of nonviolence in the 20th century to the National Mall. Thank you. <laughs> Manjare Mathai. You are your mother's internal and external environmentalist daughter with your ultimate concerns for global restoration, the Green Belt Movement, advocating for social and environmental change locally and internationally, raising the prominence and visibility of global issues, climate change, youth leadership, sustainable energy, landscape restoration, women entrepreneurs, and renewables, Wangari Mathai Foundation, World Agroforestry, and Clean Cooking. Named one of the 100 most influential African women in 2018, 2020, and 2021. Former researcher for President Jimmy Carter at the Carter Center in Atlanta. We are now ready to let you hear her response for being so honored. You may show the video. So, President David A. Thomas, Provost and Vice President Kendrick Brown, Vice President Hodan Hassan, and Vice President Paula Wrestley, and Dr. Lawrence Edward Carter Sr. What a privilege and a joy it was to read your absolutely most kind and generous letter. I am deeply moved and honored to receive such a warm acknowledgement of my work from one of the most prestigious institutions in the United States of America, Morehouse College, informing me of the Morehouse College's Gandhi King Ikeda Community Builders Prize. Wow, what a privilege. Thank you, thank you very much. Please accept my heartfelt gratitude for this absolutely prestigious recognition. I am humbled by this acknowledgement of my efforts in fostering 
global peace, addressing and championing climate and climate vulnerability in communities worldwide, so many of whom are often not seen or heard. It is truly inspiring to be recognized by an institution with such a rich history and commitment to social justice. Led by distinguished individuals like David Thomas and Chairman Willie Woods. A privilege truly to be today joining such a distinguished group of previous winners. The values embodied by Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr. and Daisheku Ikeda have long served as guiding lights in my work towards promoting a sustainable future, sustainable practices, youth empowerment, youth leadership, women's empowerment, and women's leadership. And now environmental conservation, environmental restoration, especially as it pertains to alleviating poverty. Receiving a, an award that bears the names of these giants is a profound honor, and I will cherish it deeply. I'm grateful for the support of the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel and Morehouse College in recognizing the importance of addressing global challenges and advocating for positive change. This award absolutely fuels my commitment to continuing to strive for the issues we all care about, a more sustainable future, a fairer future, an equitable world for present and future generations. I have to add that in my years in Atlanta, when I lived in that great city, every Christmas I would run to Morehouse College and Spelman to enjoy the beautiful Christmas concert. So to know that the Morehouse Glee Club is performing with you today is an added joy for me. I absolutely cherished those concerts and I hope that one day I will be back to enjoy them. Rest assured that I will come to the campus to celebrate with you. That is my promise. I'm so sorry I cannot be with you this time, but remember that I am forever now a member of this wonderful community. So I want you to enjoy today and I especially want to thank my dear friend Wandia Mbubi and whoever else is there of my wonderful friends for representing me. You have the best of Kenya with you today. So once again, let me thank you for this incredible honor from the bottom of my heart. I am truly grateful and I look forward to continuing our collective efforts towards a more peaceful and sustainable future. To the entire Morehouse community and family, thank you, thank you, thank you. And as we say here in Kenya, Asante Sana. See you soon. Gary John Dorian. When we prioritize the well-being of all, our notions of success and purpose are elevated. As a liberal liberationist, preeminent theologian, social ethicist, historian, and philosopher, you think about what is common and what is good with magisterial moral excellence. Your publications are for the ages, highlighting the importance of justice, compassion, dialogue, and action in our responses to personal, social, religious, national, global, and cosmic trauma. Your ethical imperative demands a transcendent critique. Thank you very much. Robert C. Davison. Luck is where preparation meets opportunity. In directorships, memberships, trusteeships, ambassadorships, 
and multiple chairmanships in medicine, the arts, in culture, liberal arts education, chamber orchestras, big brothers, children's hospitals, art museums, recording labels, surface industries, the finest collections of African American art, black Jewish economic development, you know, investor minority control businesses, founder of the Urban National Cooperation of Boston, and founding benefactor of Davison House at Morehouse. All make you a humanitarian idealist. Your work resonates with the citizens of Pasadena so powerfully they have pressured you to run for mayor of Pasadena. And you are a history maker as the first African American elected chairman of the Smithsonian American Arts Museum's Board of Commissioners. Frederick J. Eichenrenkota II, better known as Reverend Ike. <laughs> Reverend Ike's wife and his son. Affectionately known <laughs> as Reverend Ike, he came from a place of prominent obscurity and transformed himself into the power of prophetic possibilities. He helped millions to access a level of their dreams they had not previously realized were available. He taught that traditional institutionalized religion was built on a slave theology while he preached a radically liberal theology based on two biblical texts. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I came that you might have life and have that more abundantly. All of this for him would set the captives free. His teaching helped millions develop self-control, self-respect, and peace within. He was the most seriously successful at breaking the colonial grip of religious fundamentalism. Reverend Ike's life was his message. Joyce Finch Johnson. <laughs> By age seven, you were playing hymns in local churches. The first African-American woman to earn her doctorate in piano at Northwestern University. Listed on the international roster of Steinway artists. Longest serving tenured organist in the American Academy. <laughs> Over 70 years. Playing the King of Instruments in Spellman's Sister's Chapel. Now, I think I've got this right. For 48 hours, ushering the ascending spirit of Martin Luther King Jr. into the sacred precincts of glorified immortality and into the divine company of the ancestors, the ages, 
and the archangels, while an endless procession of grieving humanity signified the end of his beloved incarnation. Joyce Finch Johnson, a legend. Clarence Benjamin Jones. You heard him on the video. I'm going to have, is Brenda left? Brenda, why don't you stand for him? Since you introduced the video. <laughs> Member of the legal defense team for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Charged with tax fraud by the state of Alabama, King was acquitted. Fortune Magazine's Man of the Month, twice, chosen to address the 2024 Super Bowl audience of over 123.7 million people. You saw the video. Speaking on anti-Semitism, and racism. General Counsel of the Gandhi Society for Human Rights, the SCLC fundraising arm, and a member of King's Research Committee, helping him always remain situationally relevant. Jones disseminated King's letter from the Birmingham jail in 1963, advised and copyrighted King on his I Have a Dream speech, 1963, and Beyond Vietnam speech, 1967, and represented the SCLC in the landmark libel case, New York versus Sullivan, 1964. Jones was requested by New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller to serve as a negotiator during the Attica prison riot editor, publisher, and part owner of the New York Amsterdam News. Thank you. <laughs> Alfred Daniel Williams King, the fateful nonviolent brother of the nation's most famous social prophet, was a 1959 alumnus of Morehouse College. One year later, he was arrested at a whites-only lunch counter sit-in in Atlanta. And in 1963, while pastoring at First Street Baptist Church in nearby Inslee, Alabama, A.D. was a leader of the Birmingham campaign. When protests escalated with blacks throwing rocks at policemen, A.D. climbed onto the top of a parked car and shouted to the rioters to quell their fury, my friends, we've had enough problems tonight. If you're going to kill someone, kill me. Stand up for your rights, but with nonviolence. Like his brother, A.D. was a staunch believer in the importance of maintaining nonviolence in direct action campaigns. However, unlike his brother, A.D. was able to remain mostly outside the media spotlight, in the background, but many people never knew that he was deeply involved also. In 1968, he was successful in a campaign for open housing ordinances in Atlanta and active in the Poor People's Campaign. His wife, Naomi Ruth Barbara King. She only passed a few weeks ago at the age of 92. 
She was a role model of nonviolence and peace, a sweet spirit to encounter on a down day, and an angelic presence. A civil rights activist in her own family tradition from Dotham, Alabama, who grew up in Atlanta's Ebenezer Baptist Church under the leadership of MLK Sr., whose young son she married. Together, they supported MLK Jr. when, in 1955, Rosa Parks was arrested. He was present at the creation, she was present at the creation of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And when students in Greensboro, North Carolina, launched the sit-in movement in 1960, also through the Birmingham campaign and the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom and the bombing of her home in 1963. And throughout 1965's campaign to vote in Selma, she founded the A.D. King Foundation and received the SCLC Rosa Parks Freedom Award in 2008. Bishop Carlton Demetrius Pearson. The greatest benefit to humankind cannot be fueled by fear. Fear cannot change the world for the common good. Only fearlessness can do that. The bishop preached the gospel of inclusion, reaching beyond religious fundamentalism to ancient new thought, to awaken humanity to the nonviolent, unconditional, and all conditional, forgiving agape love of Christ, Bishop Pearson committed his ministry. For this, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Blessed are the saints who die in the Lord, and their good works will follow them. Jacob Mortimer Rothschild. I can't tell you enough about him. A truly courageous and remarkable human being. Rothschild. Rabbi Rothschild was the rabbi of Atlanta's oldest and most prominent Jewish synagogue. He was disturbed by the depth of racial injustice he witnessed in Atlanta when he arrived in 1947 and resolved to make civil rights a focal point of his rabbinical career. He invited prominent black leaders like Benjamin E. Mays to the synagogue to lead educational luncheons at the temple. Rabbi Rothschild helped to draft and conceive the Atlanta Minister's Manifesto calling for the turning point in race relations that was published not only in the Atlanta Journal and Constitution but was also published in the United States Congressional Record. His outspoken support of civil rights, the civil rights movement, made the synagogue a target for extremist violence. On October the 12th, 1958, 50 sticks of dynamite exploded at the temple on Peachtree Street. And all this did was strengthen the rabbi's reputation of directly speaking out in behalf of civil rights. He forged a close personal friendship with Martin Luther King Jr. 
as Archbishop Paul J. Hannon did. And Dr. Mays persuaded both of them, the rabbi and the archbishop, to join him. And Ralph McGill of the Atlanta Constitution calling for Atlanta to hold its first integrated dinner in downtown Atlanta. Ivan Allen was mayor and he stepped in to help. And I'm going to deviate from my script to tell you that the top business executives of this city turned their back on their idea of honoring kings winning the Nobel Peace Prize. And so the mayor called Robert Woodruff, the chairman and president of Coca-Cola, and told him that the dinner was going nowhere. And I've been Alan heard Robert Woodruff say, call the executives of corporations throughout the city and tell them that Coca-Cola does not have to stay in Atlanta. The rabbi was so popular that he was selected to preside at the dinner honoring Dr. King. And he was also chosen to deliver the eulogy for the city of Atlanta at the St. Paul's Episcopal Cathedral on Peachtree. I will stop with that, but it goes on and on. He was truly a good man. Timothy Wayne Sloan. There are few things more beautiful than the heart of a good shepherd. The grieving, suffering, lonely, hungry, and HIV AIDS souls of our planet benefit most from the quality of your humane pastoral care and counseling. The growth of the Luke Church in Texas from 300 to 5,000 is a testament to you being the royalty of the pulpit, the divinity of Christ, the word made flesh, and a pastor superior. Last but not least, Richard Lewis Taylor of Boston. The history of metropolitan Boston, the state of Massachusetts, and the island of Martha's Vineyard cannot be written without mentioning the name Richard Lewis Taylor. A precedent-setting Rhodes Scholar at Boston University, he was the first, and mentor to the second Rhodes Scholar, also an African American. First black appointed to the governor's cabinet as Secretary of Transportation and Construction. Strategic planner to a wide range of industries at Fortune 500 companies. Generous philanthropist, author, historian, fundraiser, and builder of civilizing institutions. You have my sincerest congratulations. And then shall the trumpet sound.
One more thing. Mrs. Ike requested an opportunity to say something to you. Mrs. Eula Dent Acker-Rincoder, wife of Reverend Ike. I guess you know this is a total surprise to me. <laughs> but it is so nice to be here today, I tell you. I wouldn't have wanted to be any other place than here. Um, Morehouse certainly has a place, and has always had a place in our hearts, and that of Reverend Ike and my son, Xavier. So we are just so pleased and so happy to meet all of the other honoraries here today. It's just been wonderful, and I thank you, Dr. Carter. Reverend Ike was a benefactor to the chapel. Ladies and gentlemen, this ends our program. <laughs>